Red meat is bad. Cholesterol is bad. Plant-based diets, as if there were any other kind, are good. Low-fat diets are good. Butter is bad. Vegetable oils are good. Coffee may cause pancreatic cancer, which is, you know, bad. Bread causes diabetes. Keto diets cure diabetes. Soda is evil. Anything artificial is bad. Everything natural is good. You've heard all of this, and you may even believe some of it. None of it has been proven, because nothing in science outside of the realm of pure logic and mathematics is ever proven. Science is set up to disprove things, not to prove them. But none of those claims have even been disproven, because to disprove things with science, you have to do good science. And good nutritional science is almost a contradiction in terms. The amount of bad information out there is just unbelievable. Today, I'm going to give you a few tips to sort through the nutrition science, or at least relax about it. Hey, Grace Steel Nation, Sully here with the Barbell Prescription, keeping you fit after 50. The athlete of aging must be a sophisticated and critical consumer of research in general and exercise and nutritional research in particular. Please note that this is not the same as being cynical about science and it is certainly not the same as being an anti-rationalist or a science denier. Science remains our best method for inquiry into nature. Nature being the totality of processes or phenomena that actualize as observable states of affairs, which is to say, the universe. Nobody is more critical of a scientific finding than a scientist, and in an ideal world, the most critical scientist is the one who makes the finding. Alas, science is a human enterprise and prey to human foibles, so we need to proceed with caution. But how? My purpose here is to give you some general guidelines to approach the nutritional claims you see in the media and put them into the proper perspective. So, here's a step-by-step -step approach to evaluating nutrition science and exercise science claims that you find in the media. Step one, consider the source. Let's say you hear that eating tomatoes is associated with colon cancer. Great googly moogly. That sounds bad. But before you give up BLTs, insalata caprese, and spaghetti sauce, you need to begin by considering the source. I don't want to shock you, but it turns out that social media is not a great source for scientific information. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok aren't peer-reviewed, and they make their money from generating clicks, not credibility. I'm not on the social media is evil bandwagon. I just try to keep an eye on what I'm doing with social media. What I'm doing is not scientific research. Likewise, news media is looking for headlines and sound bites, not a sophisticated presentation of hard data, complete with shortcomings, shades of gray, and uh, context for interpretation of that data. There are good science channels on YouTube, like Veritasium, SciShow, Healthcare Triage, PBS Spacetime, The Royal Institute, 60 Symbols, and the like. And tell us your favorite science channels in the comments, and give us a like while you're at it. That really helps us out. So yeah, there are online sources that look at scientific data more critically. But in general, you need to consider such sources as a starting point, not the final word. This all seems like it should go without saying, but recent events suggest otherwise. Step two, go to the research. So you read about the killer tomatoes and both your concern and interest are stimulated, but you know Facebook science is not a thing. So what next? First, look for a link to the original research. At the very least, see if you can find the title, the authors or journal in which the data was presented. If this information was not given, ask for it. And if there's no reply or it turns out that the claim rests on anything besides actual data, you're done. Make yourself a nice tomato and red pepper bisque and get on with your life. If you do have a citation for the data, look it up. Is it really data? 
or is it an opinion piece or an editorial? Opinion pieces and editorials are not scientific data, although they may give you citations. You're interested in actual studies that have been published after peer review. If you don't find any, you can stop worrying about tomatoes for now. Step three, evaluate the study. This is where you have to dig in. Look at the title of the paper and the abstract. If you can get the entire paper for free, do so. Download, print, read. What kind of study is it? Is it a study at all? If you're really worried about tomatoes, what you're looking for is actual hard data, preferably from an experiment specifically designed from the beginning to assess the impact of tomatoes on the development of colon cancer. What would that look like? Such a study, properly designed, would be a randomized controlled trial, and it would say so right there in the abstract. It would say that subjects were randomly allocated into two groups, one given a tomato-eating diet and one given a non-tomato-eating diet. The study outcome would be colon cancer. If it doesn't say that, it's not a randomized controlled trial designed to assess the effect of one variable, tomatoes, on another, colon cancer. Furthermore, to be robust, this study would be large and would go on long enough for an actual disease signal to register. Even the most evil tomato will take time to cause colon cancer. We're talking hundreds of subjects at least and years of observation. When the experiment is over, you'll have data on the causal relationship between tomatoes and cancer. Depending on how you actually perform the study, that data may be good or it may be bad, but it will speak to the critical issue of causation. It should not surprise you to learn that this sort of thing is very difficult. And that's why most nutritional science doesn't look like this at all, which is another way of saying why most nutrition science sucks so bad. Most nutritional research is observational epidemiological research. Here's how that works. You send out surveys or do interviews with scads of folks, asking them about their medical history, age, weight, smoking, exercise, and of course, diet. You take their responses at face value and plug it into your data analysis and statistical software, fishing for any associations you might be able to publish. That's right. This sort of research, which constitutes the vast bulk of published nutrition science, tells us about association or correlation. It does not tell us about causation because it can't. It's not an experiment. It's just a fancy sort of survey. The surveys can help us generate hypotheses, but they cannot disprove hypotheses. They are at best a starting point, and at worst, they are totally misleading. So in your tomato panic, you may track down an observational study, a glorified survey that says Daily tomato intake was associated with a 50% increased risk of colon cancer. Yikes! But calm down. There are two critical things to keep in mind here. First, this study, which is not a randomized controlled trial, does not show that tomatoes cause colon cancer. Because, again, such an observational study cannot address the issue of causation. Second, we need to understand exactly what the authors mean by a 50% increased risk. And that's step four. Step four, be clear on relative versus absolute risk. Now, most nutritional studies report relative increases or reductions in risk or benefit, just as most pharmaceutical and therapeutical studies do. That's because relative risk numbers are more dramatic and easier for us to wrap up inside our monkey brains. In the tomato study, the researchers report that the subjects who ate tomatoes were at a 50% increased risk of cancer over those who did not eat tomatoes. The question you need to ask yourself is, 50% of what? Well, it means 50% higher than the risk of colon cancer in those who did not gorge themselves on tomatoes, or at least those who did not report gorging themselves on tomatoes. So it might look like this. That is some spooky ketchup right there. But is it really? Even assuming this finding is correct, a big assumption as we will see, 
we are missing some critical contextual information because this is the relative risk, not the absolute risk. What was the absolute risk in those miserable souls who denied themselves extra helpings of tomatoes Provençal and pizza margarita? That might take a little more digging, but if we are dogged about it, we'll find that risk to be a little less than 3%. These estimates vary, further muddying the waters. We'll round it up to three. That is the absolute risk of bowel cancer in all comers. It's the baseline risk, which is increased by 50% in tomato eaters, if the study is to be believed. Okay, this allows us to put our absolute tomato risk into a more illuminating perspective. That tells a rather different story. The absolute risk of cancer in this population is low, 3%. And so the 50% relative risk increase is that same low number times 1.5, which is a low number. The relative risk increased by 50%, which sounds, oh wow, but that really just means that the absolute risk was a bit higher in tomato lovers, 4.5% versus 3%. Not nearly as exciting. This works the other way too. A 50% relative risk decrease in liver failure or heart disease or spontaneous combustion Sounds huge, but probably does not indicate a superfood or a miracle drug, even if we can trust the data, because the absolute risk is not large to begin with. Of course, presenting the data as an increase or decrease in absolute risk is about as sexy as a bag of used cat litter and will not get you clicks, commercials, commissions, or funding. So, of course, they present data in terms of relative risk. Beware. Step five, how was the data gathered? What you're really asking here is, did they really eat all those tomatoes? See, it gets even worse. If you look at our very alarming tomato study, which remember was an observational study, a fancy survey, not an experiment, you're likely to find that the methods for determining what the subjects actually ate was flawed. Most nutritional studies, even most of the experiments rely heavily on food diaries, which in turn rely heavily on the recollection of the subjects. Tell me something, what exactly was your tomato intake like 12 years ago? Uh-huh. So, food diaries are notoriously inaccurate and have been repeatedly debunked, but they are still used because it turns out you can't just lock up thousands of people and make them eat tomatoes for 15 years. Step six, look for confounding. Observational studies, which again are really just sophisticated surveys, are prone to all sorts of confounding variables and biases. For example, let's consider a hypothetical study in which it was found that meat eaters have a greater risk, reported as relative risk of course, for cardiovascular disease than vegans. With just a little imagination, you can come up with why this association does not and cannot implicate a causal effect of red meat. For example, you might suppose that vegans and vegetarians are more health conscious, more likely to exercise and meditate, less likely to smoke cigarettes and snort meth, and so on. Studies often claim to correct for such confounders, but that's baloney. They just can't. The number of known and hidden confounders is just too large. Step seven, find the poo. You gotta have poo. Do you care what your cholesterol is? I mean, do you really care? Why? Perhaps because doctors and the media have told you that you should, based on the idea that it's a biomarker of risk for cardiovascular disease like heart attack and stroke. But at the end of the day, you don't really care about your serum cholesterol. You care about heart attack, stroke, disability, and death. These are what we call patient-oriented outcomes, or poos, and they are what really count. But they are not what gets reported in a lot of nutritional studies, which tend to focus on stuff like cholesterol, HDL-LDL ratios, serum lipids, HbA1c, prostate-specific antigens, CRP, calcium scores, and other laboratory and imaging metrics. Why? 
because those measurements are easier, cheaper, and more likely to change over the course of the study than the actual poos. Now, this is not to say that such findings are completely without importance as mechanistic or hypothesis-generating data, but they are not what is truly relevant and important to you. If you're steered toward a nutrition study that claims to affect health, but find that the outcome measurements are laboratory or imaging results rather than meaningful poos, you should be very skeptical. There's more, a lot more. Nutritional science is, in a very real sense, a kind of a social science, and they don't call social sciences soft sciences for nothing. But even if we give nutritional science a mulligan for that, it's still lame because it continues to use observational data with flawed methods to make strong and severe recommendations about what we should eat in spite of a very poor track record. There was never a solid basis for telling us to switch from the traditional American diet of our great-grandfathers to a low-fat, high-carb diet, a change which led to an explosion of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. There's no better basis now for telling us that we should stop eating bacon or go Mediterranean or do the vegan thing, or not. We've talked about this before. The bottom line, making a big change to your diet because you read this or that news report or social media post is a bad idea. Changing on the basis of the latest study claiming a 25% reduction or increase in this or that isn't much better. Don't let yourself drift hither and yon on the current of today's nutritional news, which will be tomorrow's debunked fad. Stick to your fundamentals. Now you know what to do. Watch your intake. Eat whole fresh foods, freshly prepared. Manage your portions and your eating space time. Keep sugar down to a dull roar. Get your fiber and your protein. Optimize your pre and post workout nutrition. Minimize restaurant eating. Eliminate snacks and cut down on the black tar heroin. You'll be promoting good health and staving off disease more effectively by sticking to these fundamentals than by changing your diet every time a new scientifically based food fad hits the interwebs. Thanks for watching.